Um, it's really a pleasure to invite one of our founding members of this symposium, um, Sabrina Phillips, to talk about one of the most important topics that we are now dealing with, which is contraception in pregnancy and congenital heart disease. Sabrina. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, again to chat with you guys, and especially in a combined session about something that I'm pretty passionate about. One of my uh, most favorite subsets of what I do in the uh, day is counsel families and patients and other providers about pregnancy. And this is really key because there's a lot of misinformation both in the medical community and in the patient community about this. And I think um, when we get this wrong, we have a huge impact on people's lives. So we want to do this right. So hopefully in the next uh, 15 or 12 or 15 minutes, I can give an overview uh, for, that will cover the topic for both patients and providers, let them know why we think pregnancy is such an important thing to be concerned about in heart disease and how we can uh, have successful uh, pregnancies and families. So again, no disclosures. So sometimes when we're faced with a patient with complicated heart disease or maybe heart disease that isn't that complicated but has some sequelae, we're concerned that it's like managing a ticking time bomb. We don't know what's gonna happen. So how do we effectively assess a patient pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy and get them successfully through this? So first, We've got to understand, as providers, the physiology of pregnancy and delivery, because it's pretty profound. Talk about a nine-month stress test. Uh, there's nothing that I can do on the treadmill or in the bike uh, to a patient that's like what pregnancy does. And so we need to understand that so that we can help explain to our patients what concerns they may face during pregnancy. Then we need to be able to define the anatomy. And this sounds so simple, but I can tell you that I recently in the last year had a patient come to me who went to counseling pre-pregnancy um, to a high-risk OB, did not see a cardiologist. Um, the high-risk OB misunderstood the anatomy. Um, and counseled the patient that would be no big deal to have a pregnancy. Well, the patient was an unbalanced AV canal, status post fontan palliation, but it was reported out in the note as a AV canal defect status post repair with good ventricular function. And so the patient was quite shocked when she came to me and I said, you know, you're a single ventricle. Did, did anyone explain to you that this is going to be a high-risk pregnancy? She didn't know that. She didn't know her own anatomy, unfortunately. That's not her fault. That's our fault for not educating it. But we've got to define the anatomy appropriately and know what the consequences of pregnancy physiology is. And then we've got to apply that physiology to the anatomy because there this is a complicated process. I could have two patients with tetralogy come in and they could be quite different, apples to oranges, in terms of what they're functional anatomy is right then. Maybe one has severe PR and the other one has a competent pulmonary valve. That's different in pregnancy. So what's the physiology? Well, the key thing I want you guys to know is that we're going to increase all the fluid in the tank. All the blood volume is going to increase, maybe by over 50% over the course of pregnancy. And it starts early, and it accelerates rapidly during the first and second trimester. Your red blood cells, they keep up with that somewhat, but not as much. So you get a relative anemia during pregnancy. And there's some fancy things that happen with all the hormonal you know, signals that, uh, from the kidney to the blood vessels that make this happen. But what's really important is we get an increase in volume, but we tell our blood vessels to stay dilated. So that's really important. And all other forms of physiology, if we started signaling to increase blood volume, hold on to salt and water, we'd eventually clamp up our blood vessels. We don't do that in pregnancy. It's pretty fascinating. So we need to understand that as doctors uh, and providers who are going to be treating patients. So overall, bottom line, we're going to increase your blood volume. Fluid in the tank is going to go up. We're going to decrease the resistance to blood flow in the vessels in your body and probably some in your lungs. We don't understand that physiology as well. We're going to make your heart rate increase a little bit, maybe about 10 beats per minute, and your blood pressure overall is not going to change very much because we're going to have this increase in, cardio in blood volume, but dropping the resistance keeps the blood pressure kind of stable. But the amount of blood you put out per heartbeat or per minute is going to increase 
about 30% over baseline just through pregnancy. I mean, because you've got to you got to feed another human that you're building, and then it's going to get even more profound during labor and delivery. So this is pretty important. Cardiac output, that's how much blood flow can I put out per minute out of my heart to deliver to my tissues. And you can see that it is like a rapid, huge increase here over the course of the first two trimesters. And then it does kind of slowly flattens out, but still slowly increasing towards the end. So the heart does this in a couple of important ways. Uh, the LV mass increases, so we get more uh, factory workers to make the heart pump better. And then the heart, we hope, it doesn't actually, the ejection fraction, everybody's used to talking about that, it doesn't get better, but the heart relaxes faster if it's gonna adapt to this physiology normally. So that's what we wanna have happen, this really rapid relaxation improvement in diastology, and the heart gets a little more globular. EKG changes a little bit, not too much. So because of this increased blood flow, if we're examining you in pregnancy, I expect to hear a systolic murmur, no matter what your baseline physiology is, because now you're driving more blood flow out. And so if you have a pulmonary circuit, I should hear blood flow moving through that. And that's usually what this systolic murmur is. And that extra blood flow makes your first heart sound. If you have a tricuspid and a mitral valve, I should hear them split. And sometimes I'll hear if your heart's relaxing really fast and you're sucking this blood volume in, I'll hear this little rumbling sound called the third heart sound, and that's normal. It's not normal if I hear a sound in diastole. I can't think of much physiology that's normal for that. And it shouldn't be normal to hear this fourth heart sound or this sound of needing to really push blood into the pump. So that helps as you're examining a patient to know what's normal and what's normal, because pregnancy, Sometimes it mimics cardiac disease. You ladies know if you've been pregnant, we get swollen ankles. We sometimes get our JVP up because we've got extra volume in the circuit. And sometimes we get this shift in our, in our apex where we feel the heart as our belly gets bigger and pushed up. But what's not normal again are these other sounds, diastolic murmurs. The second heart sound shouldn't change. We should not hear an S4. So that's the 40 weeks leading up to labor and delivery, which is an amazing stress test over a few hours. Cardiac output demands are gonna increase. They're already up, remember, maybe 50% above baseline, 30 to 50, 60 to 80% more during active labor. And part of that's discomfort, pain, and then just the need of what's happening during uh, labor. So then the volume, you've got to be really plastic in how you deal with volume in the vessels itself. So every time the uterus contracts, we get this volume pushed back into the venous system. And so then all of a sudden, as soon as the, the um, uterus is lifted off the IVC or becomes off of that, you know, after delivery, you get venous return that's really a profound, but you're also losing volume with blood loss during delivery. So it's pretty impressive rapid changes. So the best thing we can do for each patient is to know their anatomy well and what, how they're doing before they conceive. So echo is really important for us because we can repeat that. It's safe. We're not radiating you. Uh, you get a change in symptoms or status. I can redo your echo. But sometimes we need to do other things to really define your anatomy. I not, might need to do a cardiac catheterization to know how things are. I might need to do MRI, sometimes CT. Um, so we might have to use a lot of imaging modalities to understand exactly what the status is. Then we've got to apply the physiology. And the real questions we're going to ask and that we're going to try to discuss with you as a patient is, how does your heart lesion, how's it going to handle that extra blood volume? You going to be OK with that? How are you going to, can you meet cardiac output demand? So we just heard two beautiful talks uh, right after lunch about being a single ventricle. Well, if you're a single ventricle, you might have a successful pregnancy. But one of the key concerns is you might not be able to increase your cardiac output very much. So I'm going to be watching closely how baby's developing. Is, it, is baby doing OK? How are you handling this as that demand increases? How are you going to do with the decrease in the afterload? That's where you drop the resistance in your blood vessels. For a lot of us, that's a, a good thing. We, we're all often trained to do that in cardiology, but we might not do so well if you're a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. You might not like that. And then 
Heart rate's not such a big deal, but we should think about it a bit. So there are some tools that we use uh, as physicians to help provide you with information about what your risk to you and to your baby uh, would be during pregnancy. This is one of the oldest, but actually one of the, I think the simplest tools to use and to discuss, where we just look at basically four things. Have you had a prior cardiac event? That means have you had heart failure, rhythm disturbance, a stroke? What's your, how well are you doing? Can you do what you wanna do during the day or are you limited? Are you blue at rest, less than 92%? Does your left heart have obstruction? Do you have mitral stenosis, some type of outflow stenosis? And how's your EF? And I've got LV stuff on here, and that's because that's how this was worked out. But the RV does matter, and we should put that into play. And the really simple thing is if you have one of these risk factors, your risk of a cardiac complication is about 25% during pregnancy. And I emphasize cardiac complication, not dying. It's actually very rare to die, thank God, during pregnancy, even with serious cardiac disease. But you have to be aware that you might need to be hospitalized, have medication, you might have a heart failure event. So those are things that are important to know. So who do I counsel that the risk might be quite high for completing pregnancy sex successfully? Well, patients with bad pulmonary hypertension, they don't do well in handling this volume and cardiac output, and they're actually the moms who are at risk of dying during pregnancy and delivery. Patients whose pumps are no good, if you are really struggling and you're not able to uh, maintain activities of daily living without being short of breath or swollen, you probably aren't going to handle extra blood volume better. And if you have a connective tissue disease, your aorta is big, you have Marfan, Ehlers-Danlos, Lois Dietz, maybe we should be careful that your aorta might expand during pregnancy. And if you have obstructive lesions, we need to know about that. So I'm gonna end here, but those are kind of the things we're thinking about when we're advising you. But the real question is during pregnancy and during this lead up to pregnancy is not, can I have a pregnancy? Because most of you are capable of having a pregnancy. Your, your congenital heart disease did not cause infertility, though there are a few uh, conditions that do. But the real question is, what's the risk to you? What's the risk to your baby? And what's the outlook if you have a pregnancy? Does that impact your heart? And it's up to us to try to sit down and counsel you and uh, give you the best advice. And then the choice is yours, and we should be there for you to support you the best we can during this pregnancy and delivery. Thanks.